Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Richard Ryan, and I am Senior Washington Correspondent for the Detroit News and President of the National Press Club. I would like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, and those of you who are watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio. The video archive of today's luncheon is provided by Connect Live and is available through the National Press Club website at npc.press.org. National Press Club luncheons are also carried live by many sites on the World Wide Web. Press Club members may also access transcripts of our luncheons at our website. Non-members may purchase transcripts, audio and videotapes by calling 1-888-343-1940. Before introducing our head table, I would like to remind our members of upcoming speakers. On Thursday, March 29th, former Senator Sam Nunn will speak on the new challenges facing U.S. national security. On Tuesday, April 3rd, Ted Forstman, senior partner of Forstman and & Little and chairman and CEO of Parents in Charge, will be our guest. And on Tuesday, April the 10th, Joel Klein, former Assistant Attorney General for the Antitrust Division, the U.S. Department of Justice, will be our guest. If you have any questions for our speaker, and I trust that you will, please write them on the cards that are provided at your table and send them up to me, and I will ask as many as time permits. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called, but please hold your applause until everyone has been introduced. From your right and my left, we have Joseph Layton, former Deputy White House press spokesman, one of several jobs in the government uh, Joe has held. Uh, John Donnelly, editor of Defense Week and a member of the National Press Club Board of Governors. Betty Cole Dukert, executive, retired executive producer of Meet the Press. Donna Leinwand, a national reporter for USA Today. Pat Mitchell, president and CEO of the Public Broadcasting System. Robert Coonrod, President and CEO of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and Judith Davidson Moyers, wife of our speaker, and as the president of their corporation, his boss. <laughs> Frank Ockerfer, former president of the National Press Club and chairman of the Speakers Committee. And skipping over our speaker for a moment, Askia Muhammad, panelist of WHUT TV's Evening Exchange Weekly News Analysis. White House correspondent for Final Call newspaper and the Speakers Committee member who organized today's luncheon. Thank you, Eskia. Tina Tate, director of the House and Radio TV Gallery. Bonnie Urbe, host of the PBS program To the Contrary. Mark Plotkin, political commentator for WAMU-FM. And Larry Zanuck, director of the U.S. Senate Radio and TV Gallery. In recent years, we have seen an increasing migration of journalists into politics and politicians into journalism. Our guest today, Bill Moyers, was a pioneer in this transition. He was the first politician to make the switch from politics to journalism. After more than four years in the White House as special assistant and then press secretary for President Lyndon B. Johnson, Mr. Moyers went first to Newsday as publisher before establishing a career in broadcasting that has earned him practically every award and accolade available. His accomplishments are legendary. As a broadcast journalist, Mr. Moyer has won more than 30 Emmy Awards for excellence. He also has received the George Foster Peabody Award, the Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Gold Baton Award, among many others, for the more than 200 hours of programming he has produced for Public Affairs Television, his independent production company. A survey of television critics by Television Quarterly, the official journal of the National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, placed Mr. Moyers among the top 10 journalists who have had the most significant influence on television news. Mr. Moyers is considered the thinking man's pundit. He even has proof. The International Conference on Thinking, an annual gathering of scholars and researchers, dedicated to improving critical and creative thinking, 
recently honored him as a broadcaster. They said, and I quote, his contributions to public awareness of the value and processes of thinking span multiple areas, helping the American public understand how we think. Now that's something to think about. <laughs> Born in Hugo, Oklahoma, Bill Moyers, not William, but Bill, grew up in Marshall, Texas. He once reminisced of his hometown and childhood. He said, it was a wonderful place to be poor, if you had to be poor. It was a genteel poverty in which people knew who you were and kind of looked after you. By the age of 15, Mr. Moyers was working as a cub reporter on his local newspaper, the Marshall News Messenger. In 1954, he worked on Lyndon Johnson's Senate campaign, and then at Mr. Johnson's urging, transferred from North Texas State College to the University of Texas at Austin, where he majored in journalism and worked at the Johnson family's television station. He graduated from the University of Texas in 1956 and went on to earn a Bachelor of Divinity degree at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. But instead of becoming a Baptist preacher, Mr. Moyers joined the Kennedy Johnson campaign in 1960 as Lyndon Johnson's personal assistant. After Kennedy's election, he was appointed Associate Director of Public Affairs at the Peace Corps and later became its Deputy Director. And then as a Special Assistant to Mr. Johnson, Mr. Moyers helped guide the President's Great Society program through Congress. Most recently, Mr. Moyers has produced an upcoming investigative report called Trade Secrets, which will air on PBS on March 26. This newsmaking expose will just demonstrate how a, the chemical industry has used its money, power, and influence to protect its own financial interest, despite the danger of its practices to public health. Trade Secrets is the latest in a series of Moyers reports that have examined the impact of corporate lobbying on democracy. The show is also certain to be controversial, as evidenced by a Washington Post story today claiming chemical industry officials were not interviewed for the show. Today, Bill Moyers gives us a peek inside the combined world of politics and journalism in his address, which he has entitled, Things I Would Have Told Stephanopoulos <laughs> If Only He Had Asked. Please join me in welcoming Bill Moyers to the National Press Club. Don't think of it. <laughs> Thank you for that generous introduction. Hi, my name is Bill, and I'm a recovering unimpeachable source. <laughs> I uh, understand unimpeachable source is now an oxymoron in Washington, as is McCain Republican or Democratic Party. <laughs> but. Once upon a time in another millennium, the 1960s, I was one. Deep backgrounders and unattributable tips were my drugs of choice. They could deliver a high as exhilarating as an ecstasy pill at a rave party. But they could also produce a hangover as depressing as Tom DeLay's smile. <laughs> or a joke by Al Gore. Just go to Austin and listen to me on those tapes LBJ secretly recorded. That's the sound of a young man getting high without inhaling. <laughs> I swore off 34 years ago, and I'm here to tell you that it hasn't been easy. Some of the guys, Carter, Clinton, Gore, wouldn't let me forget my former life. They kept asking me to come back to the old neighborhood for one more blast. Now, when you're addicted, you know that the brain never forgets that first high. You're never far from a relapse. I can't even watch West Wing without breaking into a sweat. <laughs> a C-SPAN briefing by Ari Fleischman sends me right to the edge. And the craving really goes into overdrive at the sight of beer on Jack Germain's tie or the smell of champagne and salami on Bob Novak's breath <laughs> are the smoothing purr of a Sam Donaldson question. But I know that just one shot 
or as Clinton would say, one snort. <laughs> and I could wind up like my friend Gergen, in and out of revolving doors and needing to go on the news hour for a fix between presidents. <laughs> Frankly, I wouldn't have made it all these years without our support group of former born-again journalists, Spin Doctors Anonymous, we call ourselves. Believe me, it takes more than 12 steps away from the old sauce before you can really get it out of your system. And it's very reassuring to sit in a circle listening to other people's stories of hitting bottom. Of course, Bill Sapphire can make a nuisance of himself, always correcting our usage, <laughs> then referring to his own political dictionary as an authoritative inside source, <laughs> and then insisting on opening every meeting by reading from the big book, the Webster's International Dictionary in Sanskrit and Latin. <laughs> and Pat Buchanan, boy, can he be a bore, bragging about all he does, uh, how he can do the all 12 steps every four years on his right foot hopping backwards. <laughs> Joe Lockwood came to his first meeting the day after Clinton left the White House. Poor Joe was feeling very humble. He just kept shaking his head and muttering, pardon me, pardon me, <laughs> pardon me. Tim Russert looked up and said, pardon you, that's rich. <laughs> and immediately Chris Matthews started shouting. Even the serenity prayer can start Chris Matthews shouting. <laughs> I'll never forget the first time Stephanopoulos joined the group. He almost broke into tears when we assured him it was okay for him now to acknowledge a higher power than Hillary. <laughs> you would have thought all the silver teaspoons had fallen out of his coat pocket. <laughs> I showed him the hallway pass that Lyndon made us use every time we needed to go to the bathroom. It required his signature. <laughs> As everyone knows, George is clearly in recovery, and his admission and his addiction is in deep remission. He's been moving from punditry to analyst and reporter in just one very short, well, very long election. George recently told Brill's content that he's using my recovery as the model for his own sobriety. I have to admit that I'm honored. After all, when I was press secretary, our credibility was so bad, Joe, we couldn't believe our own leaks. Did I mention that we actually won the Vietnam War? I suppose George figures that if I can recover into journalism, anybody can. But I'm actually not here to talk about my time in the White House. I haven't talked much about it at all, although I do plan to write about it someday soon. During the last three and a half decades, I've learned that the job of trying to tell the truth about the people whose job it is to hide the truth is almost as complicated and difficult as trying to hide it in the first place. Unless you're willing to fight and refight the same battles until you go blue in the face, unless you're willing to drive the people you work with nuts over every last detail to make it certain you got it right, and unless you're willing to take hit after unfair hit accusing you of a bias, or these days even of a point of view, there's no use even trying. You have to love it. And I do love it. I've always loved it. The White House was an aberration for me. Journalism is what I wanted to do since I was a kid. As Dick said, 50 years ago, actually on my 16th birthday, I went to work at the Marshall News Messenger. The daily newspaper in a small Texas town seemed the best place in the world to be a cub reporter. It was small enough to navigate, but big enough to keep me busy, happy, and learning something new every day. I was lucky. When I went to work there, some of the old timers were out sick or on vacation, and I got assigned to cover the Housewives Rebellion. Fifteen women in Marshall refused to pay the Social Security withholding tax for their domestic workers. The rebels argued that Social Security was unconstitutional, that imposing it was taxation without representation, and that, here's my favorite part, requiring us to collect the tax is no different from requiring us to collect the garbage. 
They hired themselves a lawyer, Martin Dawes, the ex-congressman, best known or worst known for his work as head of the House Committee on Un-American Activities in the 1930s and 40s. Eventually, the women wound up paying the tax while holding their noses. The stories that I wrote for the news messenger were picked up and moved on the Associated Press wire. One day after it was all over, the managing editor called me over and pointed to the AP ticker beside his desk. Moving across the wire at that very moment was a notice to editors, citing one Bill Moyers and the news messenger for the reporting we had done on the rebellion. I was hooked. I was hooked. Two years later, as the introduction said, as a sophomore, I decided I wanted to become a political journalist and figured experience in Washington would help me learn the ropes. I wrote a man I had never met out of the blue, a United States senator named Lyndon Johnson, and asked him for a summer job. Lucky again, I got it. By summer's end, LBJ and Lady Bird had offered me a job on their television station in Austin for $100 a week, which enabled Judith and me to marry and finish the University of Texas. We were the first station in Texas, by the way, to buy a red station wagon and christen it, what else, Red Rover. I wheeled around town in style, broadcasting from accidents and crime scenes and the state legislature, which of course was the biggest crime scene in Austin. <laughs> Looking back on all that followed, and seeing these young journalist here today, looking back on all that followed, Seminary, the Peace Corps, the White House, Newsday, PBS, CBS, and PBS again, I often think of what Joseph Lelefeld, the executive editor of the New York Times, told some aspiring young journalists. You can never know how a life in journalism will turn out, he said. Decide that you want to be a scholar, a lawyer, or a doctor, and your path to the grave is pretty well laid out before you. Decide that you want to enter our rather less reputable line of work, and you set out on a route that can sometimes seem to be nothing but diversions, switchbacks, and a life of surprises, with the constant temptation to keep reinventing yourself. And so I have. It took me a while after the White House to learn that what's important in journalism is not how close you are to power, but how close you are to reality. Journalism took me to reality. Famine in Africa, war in Central America, to the bedside of the dying, to the delivery rooms of new life. Journalism took me into the complex, intricate world of inner city families in Newark and to working class families in Franks, Milwaukee, struggling to survive the good times. I was paid richly as a CBS News analyst to put in my two cents worth on just about anything that happened on that day. Working on documentaries, I've explored everything from the power of money in politics to how to make a poem, from the mystery of chi to the miracle of how a former slave trader wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace. My life in journalism has been a continuing course in adult education, my own, and I haven't had to grow up and get a day job. <laughs> Don't tell me how lucky I am. Believe me, I know it. We have to market our programs under one name. And so mine is the one that makes it to the billboard. But the truth is, while I am enormously proud of the work our team at Public Affairs Television has produced over the course of the last 15 years, I can claim credit for only a small part of whatever it is that makes it distinctive. My single greatest piece of good fortune in television has been the fact that my chief talent seems to be for collaborators who are often braver, braver and wiser than I am. First and last, of course, is my wife of 47 years, my partner, my executive producer, the president of our company, Judith Moyers. Dick, Judith has the title. She didn't need the title to hold the power of my boss. <laughs> and and Judy Doctoroff, who joined us 15 years ago practically out of Yale, and has passed through fire and storm, producing dozens of major projects and three marvelous sons. <coughs> Sherry Jones is sitting right back there. She's a remarkable journalist, the only independent producer I know of in Washington who will still take on the really tough 
documentaries about power and policy. We've been collaborating for off and on for a quarter of a century. We did the very first documentary ever about political action committees. I can still see the final scene in that film, yard after yard after yard after yard of computer printout listing campaign contributions to members of Congress unfurled like toilet paper stretching all the way across the Capitol grounds. That one infuriated Bob just about everybody in Congress, including the best friends of public television up there. But PBS, CBS, CPB took the heat and PBS didn't melt. When Sherry and I reported the truth behind the news of the Iran-Contra scandal for a frontline documentary called High Crimes and Misdemeanors, the right-wing Taliban in town went running to the Ayatollahs in Congress who decried the fact that public television was committing horrors, journalism. The Clinton White House didn't like it. In fact, when I ran into the president by coincidence at a subsequent meeting, he stood behind someone and reached out and shook my hand and said nothing because the White House didn't like it a bit when Sherry and I reported Washington's other scandal about the Democrats' unbridled and illegal fundraising practices during the 1996 election. Those programs give me the opportunity to pay tribute to another circle of supporters without whom I would have just have been another voice in the wilderness. If PBS didn't flinch, neither did my corporate underwriter for 10 years now, Mutual of America Life Insurance Company. The president and chief executive officer of Mutual was here a little earlier, Tom Moran. I'm glad he came because I want to salute a man whose company believes that encouraging dialogue and discussion is the spirit of America who believes that independent journalism is good for democracy, and what's good for democracy is good for Mutual of America. When Tom's successor, Bill Flynn, who was then chairman, and Tom came to me 10 years ago and said, on their own initiative, we want to be your underwriter on public broadcasting, I said, look, I'm a journalist. I don't get good ratings. What I get is trouble. They said, that's all right. Before Mutual came along, I had three, I lost at least three corporate underwriters who were happy as long as we didn't make anyone else unhappy. Losing your underwriting in public broadcasting, I guess in anything, will keep the yellow light of caution flickering in a journalist unconscious. Before Mutual came along, and I kicked myself for this, I sometimes avoided even writing a proposal on a controversial subject to potential underwriters because I had told myself, convinced myself, nah, not a chance. Thanks to the camaraderie and courage of Tom Moran and Mutual of America, the yellow light flickers no more. This, <laughs> this confluence of good fortune and good company has made it possible for us to do programs that the networks dare not contemplate, with the exception of Nightline. I should have warned Stephanopoulos about all this. Commercial television ain't what it used to be when I was fortunate enough to be chief correspondent for CBS Reports. Part of the problem, of course, is, ra is ratings. It's not easy, as John Dewey said, to interest the public in the public interest. For all his experience in government, George has come to broadcasting when public policy is no longer a crucial beat. In fact, I'd say that apart from the ch obvious changes in technology, the biggest change in my 30 years in broadcasting has been the shift of content of, of, from news about government to consumer-driven information and celebrity features. The Project for Excellence in Journalism conducted a study of the front pages of the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times, the nightly news programs of ABC, CBS, and NBC, and Time and Newsweek. They found that from 1977 to 1997, the number of stories about government dropped from one in three to one in five, while the number of stories about celebrities rose from one in 50 stories to one in every 14. Does it matter? Well, as we learned in the 60s but seem to have forgotten, government is about who wins and who loses in this vast bazaar of democracy. Government can send us to war, pick our pockets, slap us in jail, run a highway through our garden, look the other way as polluters do their dirty work, and take care of the people who are already well taken care of at the expense of those who can't afford lawyers or lobbyists or have time for vigilance. It matters 
who's pulling the strings. And all Washington is about, I tell young journalists, is pulling the strings. Follow the money, follow the string, you always get the story. It also matters who defines the news and decides what to cover. It matters whether we're over at the Puffy Coombs trial checking out what Jennifer Lopez was wearing the night she ditched him, or whether we're on the Hill seeing who's writing the new bankruptcy law, who's overturning workplace safety rules, who's buying back the standards for allowable levels of arsenic in our drinking water. I need to declare a bias here. It's true that I worked for two Democratic presidents, John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, both of whom, both of whom I was proud to serve. But I did more, so more for reasons of opportunity than ideology. My worldview was really shaped by Theodore Roosevelt, whom of course I didn't know, but about whom I simply cannot read enough. Teddy Roosevelt and the muckrakers of his day whom he loved, although they persecuted him sometimes, Teddy Roosevelt got it right about power in America. Roosevelt thought the central fact of his era was that economic power had become so centralized and so dominant it could chew up democracy and spit it out. The power of corporations, he said, had to be balanced in the interest of the general public. Otherwise, America would undergo a class war, the rich would win, and we wouldn't recognize our country anymore. Shades of deja vu. Here we are again. Big money and big business, corporations and commerce are the undisputed overlords of politics and government. The White House, Congress, and increasingly the judiciary reflect their interests. There are times when I think we have a government run by remote control from the US Chamber of Commerce the National Association of Manufacturers, and the American Petroleum Institute. The GOP stands once again for the guardians of privilege. And the Democratic Party, well, who's afraid of an oxymoron? What's the role of journalism in all this? The founders of our nation were pretty explicit on this point. The First Amendment is there for a reason. It's needed to keep our leaders honest and to arm the powerless with the information they need to protect themselves against the tyranny of the powerful, whether that tyranny is political or commercial. At least, that's my bias. A college student once asked the veteran reporter Richard Reeves, what's your definition of real news? And Richard Reeves answered, the news you and I need to keep our freedom. Senator John McCain echoed this in an interview I did with him a couple of years ago for a documentary called Free Speech for Sale. That documentary, by the way, has been used by many public television stations in Pledge Week, proving that you can get a public to respond to support public broadcasting with tough journalism, even more so sometimes than you can with the river dance. <laughs> this documentary was about the Telecommunications Act of 1996, when some of America's most powerful corporations were picking the taxpayers' pockets of $70 billion. That's the estimated value of the digital spectrum that Congress was giving away to the big media conglomerates. Senator McCain said on the floor of the Senate during that debate, quote, the average American does not know what digital spectrum is. They just don't know. But here in Washington, their assets that they own were being given away and the coverage was minuscule. You will not see this story on any television or hear it on any broadcast because it directly affects them, McCain said. Sure enough, the Telecommunications Act was introduced around May of 1995 and was finally passed in early February of 1996. During those nine months, the three major network news shows aired a sum total of only 19 minutes about the legislation, and none of the 19 minutes included a single mention of the debate over whether the broadcasters should pay for the digital spectrum. The founders did not reckon on the rise of mega media, did not count on huge private corporations, private corporations, that would own not only the means of journalism, but vast swaths of the territory 
journalists should be covering. During the interview, I asked McCain if we have to rely on the media to at least analyze what the corporations are doing and the media don't do that, how do we level the playing field? And he answered, I don't know, Bill. I don't know. The problem is a real one, and we journalists know it. According to another recent study done by the Pew Research Center for the People and the Press for the Columbia Journalism Review, more than a quarter of us, more than a quarter of us journalists said that we had avoided at some point pursuing some newsworthy story that might conflict with the financial interest of their news organizations or advertisers. And many thought that complexity or lack of audience appeal causes newsworthy stories not to be pursued in the first place. I saw one study recently that as the media mergers accelerated in the early 1990s, coverage of crime on the major networks went up while coverage of serious issues, including the environment and education, went down. I don't mean to suggest that there was a golden age of journalism. I told you earlier about covering the Housewives Rebellion and Marshall. What I didn't tell you is that it was the white housewives who made news with their boycott of Social Security, not the domestic workers themselves. They were black. I wasn't sent to interview them. It didn't occur to me that I should have been sent to interview them. While Marshall was 50% white and 50% black, the official view of reality, the official view of reality, was that only white people made news. Oh, a small account of black sports, churches, or service clubs occasionally made the paper. But what blacks felt and thought never did. If blacks got into the paper at all, it was the same way they got into the movies, through the side door. I thought about this on a recent trip Judith and I made to Ireland. We came across there the story of an Irish king named Conjol, who ruled in the early 7th century. Conjol was an ambitious fellow, and even after he'd been attacked by a swarm of bees that stung him nearly blind, he succeeded in becoming the overking of his clan whereupon he had Irish law changed to make bee attacks a criminal act. <laughs> he became known as Conjol Kish, which means Conjol the half-blind or Conjol the squinting. Squinting. That sounds something like the journalism we practiced in that little town 50 years ago. We squinted. And when it came to seeing the whole community, we were half-blind. I could kick myself for the half-blindness that has afflicted me throughout the years. From the times at the White House when I admonished journalists for going beyond the official view of reality in Vietnam, to the times I have let the flickering yellow light turn red in my own mind on worthy journalistic projects. Maybe it's because I'm a Southerner and because I served in the White House that this affliction haunts me. There's a line in Tom Stoppard's play, Night and Day, when one of the characters, a, a news photographer, says, people do terrible things to each other, but it's worse in places where everybody's kept in the dark. The truth about slavery was driven from our pulpits, from our newsrooms, and our classrooms. And it took the Civil War to bring the truth home. Then the truth about Jim Crow was censored too, and it took another hundred years to produce the justice that should have followed Appomattox. In the White House, across the street, in the 60s, we circled the wagons. We grew intolerant of news that didn't make us comfortable. And if we could, we would have declared illegal the sting of the bee. So I sympathize with my friends in commercial broadcasting who don't cover the ocean they're swimming in. But I don't envy them. Having all those resources, all that money, without the freedom to use them to do the kind of stories that are begging to be done seems to me more of a curse than a blessing. Like that line from Bruce Springsteen, eating caviar and dirt. But I'm not here to scold my colleagues at the networks, nor to hold myself up as some sort of Beacon. I've made my own compromises, as I said, and benefited from the special circumstances of my own good luck. But the fact that I have been so lucky in both opportunity and colleagues shows that it can be done. All that's required 
is for journalists to act like journalists and their sponsors, public or private, to back them up when the going gets a little rough. Because when you're dealing with powerful interests, be they in government or private industry, and bringing to light what has been hidden, the going inevitably gets a little rough. We didn't play beanbag back in the Johnson administration. And it's hardly a kinder, gentler world for journalism out there today. And if it weren't for the strong support, I've served under five public television presidents. Pat Mitchell is the latest, and none has had a firmer backbone. Bob Coonrod heads the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. He's our heat shield, and he really takes it. But they've stood with us. Let me just give you a couple of examples in closing of what I mean, why this battle is never ending. Some years ago, my colleague Marty Kewen one of the great investigative journalists, of, uh, producers of our time, came to me with a report he'd heard of efforts by the agricultural chemical industry to delay and dilute an important study by the National Academy of Sciences on the effects of pesticide residues on children. David Fanning of Frontline joined us as an ally, and we set out about doing a documentary. Four to six weeks before we were finished, the industry contained a obtained a purloined copy of the rough script and mounted a sophisticated and expensive campaign to discredit the documentary before it aired. They flooded television reviewers and the editorial pages of newspapers with propaganda. A Washington Post columnist took a dig at the broadcast on the morning of the day it aired without ever having seen it and later admitted to me personally when we had a drink in this building that the, di the dig had been supplied by a top lobbyist in town. Public television stations were hit with an avalanche of disinformation and with demands that PBS, quote, obey the law, such as the First Amendment. Some station managers were so unnerved they protested the documentary with letters that had been prepared by industry. Several station managers later wrote me in their own words and in their, over their own signature apologizing for having been suckered. But here's what most perplexed us. Eight days before the broadcast aired, the American Cancer Society, a fine organization that in no way figured in our documentary, sent to its 3,000 local chapters a critique of the unfinished documentary, claiming wrongly that it exaggerated the hazards. That struck us as odd. Why was such a reputable organization taking the unusual step of criticizing a documentary it hadn't seen, that hadn't aired, and didn't claim what the society alleged. Well, an enterprising reporter in town named Sheila Kaplan later looked into this question for Legal Times, which headlined her story, quote, Porto Novelli plays all sides. It turns out that the Porto Novelli public relations firm, which had worked for several chemical companies, also did pro bono work for the American Cancer Society. Sheila Kaplan found that the firm was able to cash in some of the goodwill from that pro bono work to persuade the staff, the communication staff of the American Cancer Society to distribute some harsh talking points about our documentary that had been supplied by, but not attributed to, Porto Novelli. Others used the society's good name to discredit the documentary, including the right-wing polemicist here in town, Reed Irvine, who published a screed against, quote, junk science on PBS and called on Congress to pull the plug on public television again. PBS stood firm, again. The report aired, the journalism held up in contrast to the disinformation about it, and the National Academy of Science was liberated finally to release the report the industry had tried to cripple with propaganda. None of us, this should have surprised us. This is the industry that 30 years earlier had mounted a blitzkrieg designed to destroy Rachel Carson's credibility as soon as the New Yorker published the first of her three-part con condensation of Silent Spring. Rachel Carson was accused of a communist plot to cripple American industry. One chemical company threatened to sue Carson and her publishers if the book was released. Others threatened to withhold advertising from garden magazines and weekly supplements if they published favorable reviews of Silent Spring. The industry invested millions of dollars in public relations that paid off in support articles from the New York Times, Time, Sports Illustrated, and Reader's Digest. Then, like the American Cancer Society in our time, the American Medical Association was snookered by the industry. The AMA criticized Carson's book as a serious threat 
to the continued supply of wholesome, nutritious food. Rachel Carson was dying of cancer at the time, but events totally vindicated her. And within a year, 40 state legislatures had passed regulations concerning pesticides. But there's always the next round. Next Monday, PBS will broadcast our documentary on trade secrets. It's a two-hour investigative based on the chemical industry's own archives, on doc documents that make clear in the industry's own words what the industry didn't tell us about toxic chemicals, why they didn't tell us, and why we still don't know what we have the right to know. These internal industry documents are a fact. They exist. They're not a matter of, of opinion or point of view. They state what the industry knew, when they knew it, and what they decided to do. But their value is not just historic or journalistic. They deal with one of the big stories of our time. Over the past 50 years, you and I have lived through the chemical revolution. It's brought us many blessings. Better living through chemistry is true. But it's also brought some results we didn't ask for. Tens of thousands of synthetic chemicals have been put into products on the market, into the environment, and into our bodies, pesticides, pollutants from in industry and waste, chemicals found in ordinary industrial uh, household products, simply by being alive, by eating, breathing, drinking, going to school, or work. Every one of you in this room carries traces of industrial chemicals in your bloodstream. So does every American alive today. This we know, but very little is known about the health effects this combination of chemicals may be having on us. Just yesterday, the Centers for Disease uh, Control issued the first of several rounds of an investigation they're doing into these traces of chemicals into our body. For the purposes of our broadcast, I took part in a test of my own chemical body burden at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, which is one of the pioneers in uh, public and community health. You'll see the results of that test next Monday night. I don't want to scoop myself, but I will tell you that the test found a mix of 31 PCBs in my body, 13 dioxins, and 40 other varieties of synthetic or industrial chemicals. You'll hear the research director tell me that only one of these chemicals, lead, which has been around since the beginning of time, only one of these chemicals uh, uh, would have been in my grandfather's or my grandmother's body, because this is too recent a phenomenon. I asked him if at age 66, I should be worrying. And he said, probably not. But if you were a 21-year-old pregnant woman, the story could be different. The public policy implications of this documentary next week are profound. The documents, remember, documents that neither we nor the public, we journalists nor the public, were ever supposed to see, reveal just how the industry set out to control the regulatory system that was supposed to provide the American people with oversight and protection. But that's an illusion. We live today under a regulatory system designed by the industry itself. And the truth is, if the public, the media, independent scientists, and government regulators had known what the industry knew about the risk of its products when the industry knew it, America's laws and regulations governing chemical manufacturing would be far more protective of human health than they are today. But the industry didn't want us to know. That's the message of the documentary. That's the story. I wish I could tell you I came upon this story myself. I didn't. Jim Morris, now of US News and World Report, got wind of them when he was at the Houston Chronicle and wrote about some aspects of the their significance in a series called In Strictest Confidence. The Environmental Working Group has been looking into them as well. But it took the indefatigable Sherry Jones and her team back at this table to burrow into thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of documents to find the scarlet thread running across almost half a century. When she realized the magnitude of what she had undertaken, when she realized she needed allies and funding, she came to see Judith and me. This was almost two years ago, and our collaboration began. We designed months ago the broadcast to include a half-hour discussion of the issues raised by our document, documents and our reporting. We invited industry representatives to participate, and they have now accepted. 
Terry Yossi, who's Vice President of the American Chemistry Council, uh, is here today. Terry and I have talked several times over the past month, again just yesterday. He assured me that contrary to rumors, the chemical industry was not pressuring stations to reject the broadcast. I believe him. But I wasn't sure for a while. As I told Terry Yossi, remember my experience eight years ago, the first person to contact us from the industry was a public relations firm here in Washington noted for hiring private detectives, former CIA, FBI, and drug enforcement officers to do its investigations. The founder of the company is on the record in the Washington Post saying that sometimes corporations need to resort to unconventional resources. And some of those resources, this is a direct quote, include using deceit. Quote, I tell my clients that if you live by the sword, you may die by the sword. But if you live by the olive branch, you still may die by the sword. For PBS, it's a Damocles sword. Would you believe that the single biggest recipient of campaign contributions from the chemical industry over the past 20 years in the House is the very member of Congress whose committee has responsibility for public broadcasting's appropriations? Poor Pat. She left Ted Turner for this. <laughs> what did you say, Pat? This is nothing compared to working for Ted Turner, she says. <laughs> what would I have told Stephanopoulos if he had asked? I would have told him that in crossing over, he was coming to a journalist utopia. In many parts of the world, assassins have learned they can kill reporters with impunity. Journalists are hunted down and murdered because of their reporting. 34 died in Colombia over the last decade alone. Here, well, Don Hewitt at 60 Minutes said to me recently that the 90s were a terrible time for American journalism, but a wonderful time for American journalists. Why, I said, because we're living like Jack Welch, he said. Perhaps that's why we don't ask hard questions of Jack Welch. I don't want to claim too much for our craft, but I don't want to claim too little either. The late Martha Gellhorn spent half a century observing war and politicians and journalists too. By the end, she had lost her faith that journalism could, by itself, change the world. But she had found a different sort of comfort. It shapes human destiny, she said of our craft, but makes no last decision. Victory and defeat are both passing moments for journalists. Journalism is a means, she said, and I now think that the act of keeping the record straight is valuable enough itself. Serious, careful, honest journalism, she said, is essential, not because it is a guiding light, but because it is a form of honorable behavior involving the reporter and the reader. Thank you. You can't get off so easy. You have to get back up here. I can see you're still an editor that uh, I mentioned you were 15 when you started at the paper and you corrected me to say you were 16. You haven't lost the touch. I have here a number of questions that deal with the chemical program, as you can well be aware of. Uh, they all ask why you decided to exclude the industry. Shouldn't they have been included? Uh, do you feel that that was wrong now? Do you have regrets? And do you think newspapers might have handled that story differently since they're instructed to put the opposing view up high in the story. That's Terry Yossi's spin. He's, a good, he's good at his job. I told him, he said to me yesterday, maybe when, when he does his next, he gets his next review from his uh, executives that I'll put in a good word for him. I will. He's very good at what he does. But that's not the truth. We didn't exclude the chemical industry from our documentary. We planned a two-hour broadcast in which they would have had, will have, they are coming, to a half hour, one quarter of the broadcast to deal with the issues raised by our 
reporting. As I said, the record is there. The documents are there. It's the documents that create the discussion. We'll have that discussion, and we plan that all along. Uh, when you see the documentary, you'll see what I mean, why that's appropriate, why that's good, sound, honest, accurate journalism to m shape the broadcast so that there's half an hour in which we discuss the issues raised by reporting. They will have more time in that half hour than they would have if I had interviewed them. And if I had interviewed them, they would have claimed that I didn't give them enough of the interview and I had taken them out of context, and then they would have turned their advertising firm, their public relations firm, loose on us here, just like the agricultural chemistry did eight years ago. I'm not a fool. They will have their moments, and that was intended. The spin is they're not included. They're not included. They're not included. They are included, and they've chosen to come, and I'm glad. Terry's an honorable man, worked many years at the Environmental Protection Agency, knows this field. I'm looking for it. He says he will be on the program. I'm delighted to be there. Dr. Phil Landergan from Mount Sinai will be there, one of the leading pediatricians in the, in, the, in the world. We haven't decided which environmentalist to invite yet, and Terry hasn't told me until we talk tomorrow afternoon who will be the other representative from the chemical industry. But I just want to put the rest. They will have their time as the, in, in the broadcast, unedited. Terry asked me yesterday, will, will you tape and edit? No. Will you, put a, will you put a closing on it? No, I'll just say good night and thank you. I don't believe, we don't believe in ambush, in, in ambush journalism. I interviewed Jack Welch an hour and a half last week for another documentary we're doing on the, on, on the environment. He told me about just recently being ambushed here in, 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 in Washington at an event. He, and I said, why did you give us so much time? He said, because I didn't think you would ambush it. You don't survive very long, 30 years in particular. And I live in fear that others will harm public broadcasting for something I do. So I make sure that our reporting is fair, balanced, and accurate, and that the other side ha is heard in the broadcast. Next question. Uh, and dealing with finance, uh, uh, campaign finance re uh, legislation and reform, do you consider that passage of the McCain-Feingold or, or some similar legislation critical to our political system? I, the, the important thing is to get, to, to reduce the power of private money over public policy. Look, you live in this city. You don't need an outsider, a former insider to tell you what's happened to politics. The other big change is money, ha politics has become an arms race. Each side escalates. I feel for the politicians caught in this system. Uh, you might escalate, I escalate. We wind up having to spend all of our time raising money. And that's, you know, let's, it, is, it is legal bribery if it's not another kind of Bible. It's, it's, it's killing our democracy, folks. It's really killing our democracy, the spirit of it. I don't know if this bill is going to come out with anything that's really good or just more of an illusion. Uh, the real answer in time, the real answer sooner in time, is public funding uh, for democracy. You know, if, we're go if, if anybody's going, if I believe, if, if, if anybody's going to own the politicians, we should. Not the chemical industry, not the manufacturers industry, not the environmental organizations. We should. The voters, they should be accountable to us. The only way to do that is get public funding, like Maine, Arizona, Massachusetts. Uh, have done in the last two years with some help that, that I've given them through a foundation that as a citizen I, I run. I, I care about this issue for my three grandchildren. I don't want them growing up in a society where their civic worth is determined by their net worth. And that's what's happening. The rich have every right to buy more cars, more houses, more vacations, more leisure, but they don't have the right to buy more democracy. And they are. And if we don't change it, then as Teddy Roosevelt said, we won't know this country 20 years from now. Uh, before asking the last question, uh, we had a short question and answer period today, um, I would like to present you with a couple of things. One is a certificate of appreciation for your appearance here today at the Press Club. Thank you. And the second is the uh, Press Club mug that we give to all our guests and usable for almost anything. I appreciate your being here. Um, I, I sort of like to make this kind of a two-part question. Uh, this goes back to your days as uh, the White House Press Secretary. Uh, this question just asks, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you describe your credibility when you were a White House spokesperson? And then in a second question, you mentioned 
before that you may be writing a book about your period at the White House. And you certainly lived through and experienced one of the tum most tumultuous and uh, uh, interesting periods in our history. And when can we look forward to seeing that book? Uh, well, not for three or four years. Um, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm 66. I'm planning to retire from, from active pub television at 70, and, and the research is now being done on it. It won't be an inside story. It won't be a kiss and tell. We didn't kiss, and nobody had much to tell uh, <laughs> from that, that time. Uh, but it, it, it will be an effort, exactly as you said. I am really profoundly curious now, 40 years later, about the contradictions of that time. It was a great time to be an idealist, and yet look what happened. It was a great time to believe in that we were going to find it. There was no poll saying do a poverty war. There was, there was, there was no corporate support or a public uh, demand for a war on poverty. It was a great time to be in this city to wanting to try to make this a better country. And then all kinds of things happened, most of which I don't even understand. And I want to just reflect on it and try to see if I can put our time and our experience in the White House in some kind of context of the, of, of the 60s. It will be a modest uh, a book, and it will be three or four years before uh, we can, I can get it done, if, if by then. Uh, my credibility went up and down. At first, there was euphoria that LBJ had brought in this young man who didn't know enough not to tell the truth, and then who got in trouble for telling the truth and began to try to do what everybody else does. Uh, and then I got into trouble. We ha I said our credibility was so bad we couldn't believe our leaks. It went up and down as the fortunes, as the fortunes of, the, of, of events on the Hill, the election, when we lost all those seats in, 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 in Congress in 66. And then, of course, the war. The war is the great, great puzzle, the great, great puzzle, even to those of us who participated, some of us who were there at the time. The President was deeply conflicted about it from the very beginning. There's a record that he called me uh, very early in 64, before the campaign, and I said, you ought to take a vacation. He said, I can't take a vacation. I've got to stay and worry about that goddamn war. I said, what war? The war in Vietnam. I mean, I don't understand it 40 years later. I haven't talked much about it because I don't know what to think about it or what to say about it. But it will be that time. My credibility, you know, was up and down. I do want to say, Terry, that, that, that I'm a documentarian. I, I take too long to tell the story and I take too long to speech, but I promise you, you'll have your time, all 30 minutes of it, uh, next Tuesday, next Monday night. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moyers. And I'd like to thank you all for coming today. And I'd like to recognize students from the Annandale High School's AP Journalism class and students from Denver Academy in Denver, Colorado, who are visiting us with, with us here today. And I'd also like to thank National Press Club staff members Melinda Cook, Pat Nelson, Joanne Booz, Melanie Abdo Dermott, and Howard Rothman for organizing today's luncheon. Also, thanks to the NPC Library for the research. And thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>